Um, well, Catherine said, well, we will talk about, but we will not talk about Bruno. <laughs> 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 uh, Danielle Decatur. Um, my role is to create new sustainability programs at Microsoft focused on our data centers that help our company meet its sustainability targets, which include carbon negative, water positive, zero waste by 2030, and to protect more land and be used by 2025. But my primary responsibility at the moment, and has been for a couple of years, is to integrate environmental justice and co-benefits for under-resourced communities um, into our sustainability commitments. Um, and I'm just thrilled to be here with you all today um, to talk more about that. Hey everyone, hola, uh, hoy, Rato de Gente también de Portugués. My name is Alfredo González Venezuela. I'm originally from Cusco, Peru, in the highlands of the Incas. And I come into this work because I care about what's going on in Mother Earth in Quechua. And let's see, uh, I love working for this organization called Mobilize Green. We jumpstart green careers for diverse youth. And I'm just thrilled to be here with you today. Hello, uh, I am Heather Mentor Tony, Vice President of Environmental Defense Fund and United Community Engagement. I have a lot of titles, we will probably talk about a few of them. My favorite title is our Mom and Babe. No, you did not call me either. <laughs> 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 I'm sorry for the very, very, very interested uh, And uh, I center people in our work. I center people in solutions for our work. And uh, what brings me to this space is being excluded from the space. And I'm going to talk about that. Hi, I'm Michael Gorey, and I'm Chief Sustainability Officer at Starbucks. I spent uh, 22 years before this at the Best Rousey Company. I guess I'll share with you that I'm a third generation Japanese American. Uh, my father was born in a sharecropper's cabin in Salinas. Both my parents were in the internal camps for World War II. And I have, I now have the privilege and the responsibility. I just uh, was named to the board of Bungie LTD, which is one of the largest agricultural companies in the world. And so I feel like it's an uh, awesome responsibility for me to kind of, to make sure that companies are doing the right things. Thank you very much. I tell you the other day, I don't know why. All right, so a little bit about you. Raise your hand if you work for a company. Keep your hand up if you're at least partially responsible for this kind of strategy. Okay, lots of kind of people. All right, hand up if you're partially responsible for the social equity strategy. Okay. There's some overlap, we have some new people here, but I'm glad to see that overlap. A little worried about that. How about consultants? Are you a consultant in climate? Equity? Both. All right, good news. Civil society and jobs here? No? Great. All right, how about uh, students? I've noticed lots of students. Yes, here. students. I'm a, I'm a student of life. Oh, Mark, you all. Yes, well said, well said. Academia, professors, non Oh, I really put myself in the middle of it. 
I, uh, I was looking, I was like, I'm uh, saying it. Tell me what you say a lot. <laughs> I grew up in Florida, and I'm over 60 now in Florida when I was a teenager. It was like living, well, it is the deep south, it, and people don't understand that about Florida, but it is. Um, and my first boyfriend was African American. And the prejudice that I experienced because of my choice lives with me to this day. And I'll leave it at that, but it was horrendous. Thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. That was really brave. Really appreciate it. You know, I asked the question, panel, to, to the audience about environmental justice or climate justice. Um, one, thank you. Paying attention. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I asked the question about environmental justice or, or climate justice. And when I talk to people about climate justice, they almost invariably start talking to me back about environmental justice. Can those terms be used interchangeably? And if not, what's the difference? Uh, I'll jump in on that one. It's something I hear a lot. It is climate and environmental justice all put together in one word. And it's really two different things. Environmental justice deals with policy. Policies that are impacting communities uh, that have been in some way disproportionately harmed land, water, air. And it is a historic event that is taking place. Climate justice deals with adaptation and resiliency of future events that are going to happen. So as we see an increase in extreme weather, an increase in um, um, global emissions, as we do not decrease uh, the emissions across our planet, we know that there are some communities and some people that will be disproportionately impacted if nothing is done. So I always describe it like this. Climate justice is like having a spigot and a water hose attached. When you turn the spigot off, it doesn't mean that the water is out of the water hose goes away. It just means that there's no more water coming into the hose. If that water, if you just leave it, I'm from the south, y'all, from the city. If you just leave it in one spot in the yard, that yard becomes muddy, that one spot becomes flooded, and the rest of the, the grass is going to be fine. Climate justice is if we turn off the spigot and stop global emissions, we don't figure out what's going to happen to the stuff that people are going to be sacrificed. Environmental justice is a policy. Is that helpful? It is. Michael, did you want to add to that? I agree with everything. <laughs> I always agree with everything that they said. And I just add some of the way I think of it. Look, I'm, I'm an old guy. And for me, environmental, I think about environmental justice, and I think about when this concept arose, at least in my recollection, right, it was in the 70s, with the ecology movement, and the first group did that in 1971. In fact, everybody asked me what this flag is on my jacket, that's the original ecology flag. <laughs> Don't feel bad to you know, I'll learn you know what it was. Um, <laughs> so I think about it, like environmental justice starting then, and it was very much in sync with all of the, you know, the Asian American studies, African American studies, Chicago studies that were happening at the same time in history. And the movements happened almost together. Like I remember there's an old Marvin Gaye song, Mercy Mercy Me, The Ecology. That was like the subtitle of that song. And he was talking, he was singing about both movements. That's kind of how I think about environmental. Just as I feel like climate justice is a more recent term when we're talking about the climate crisis, and like, like Evan was saying, you know, about, about climate justice. So that's my differentiation a little bit. I don't know if that's right or not. <laughs> but it's my recollection. <laughs> that's a good one. <laughs> Any, anything to add? I we're still in such a lag, because I just wanted to quit with it. Thank you for bringing Marvin Gaye into this. <laughs> <laughs> That's all. And I just agree with what I said. So, 
You know, when I started talking to companies about uh, climate justice, what I found for many of them that, that kind of just sort of starting this journey is their approach to it is very much like the early approach of maybe for many companies, the current approach to the SDGs. By the way, people standing up, please. Um, but, and that is, for those of you who look the global goals of the SDGs. We started with looking at what we were already doing and seeing how we could map it. And say, oh yeah, we're doing something wrong. Like, oh yeah, that thing we're already doing, we can do it. There was certainly no additionality associated with that. And when I talked to companies, many of them, when I asked about what you're doing environmental justice, what they've, they've done is look at what they're already doing. Look at what I would call collateral co-benefits, right? But not intentionality in driving it into their strategy. So the question I have, all of you, each of you, I guess, is should all companies be looking at justice in their, their climate strategies, and if so, why? It's an easy question. <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to start? Uh, I'd like to actually take a step back before we dive into this, because I think you, you raised the question on language, right? And, uh, and so before that, let me just ask two quick questions. Do I have any system thinkers? I know I have a lot of business folks, but do I have system thinkers in the room, right? Leverages, le leverages in systems? Okay. Do I have folks who have been outside the US to places where English is not the first language? Okay. So, are we, are we also gonna, are we? And so when you're in those situations and you don't speak those languages, what, who do you go talk to? Other English speakers, right? And so we're here to uh, talk about business and the economy, and the economy when you break down the language is the status of home, right? And the status of home here, when we start talking about environmental justice, to me, what you're saying is true, and it's true for you, what this gentleman is saying is true. What everyone here that is coming in is saying is true. I have a different thing about it because I come from a place that's also different, true. So the speaker yesterday was saying, right, what is the language of business? Accounting. Okay. So what is the language of Mother Earth? Food, right? The language of the native people who were here. The language of many other languages that we're using out there. So I just want to make a distinction there because when we're talking about the leverages of change, one the, the first one is changing the values and the behaviors, right? And so when we're talking about leverages of change, I think we need to make a point there that in order for us to have the impact we want with the strategies we're having, because right now, the outcomes right now, they're not working for the communities on uh, uh, the front line. Mm -hmm. The values have to change. Mm -hmm. The behaviors have to change. And so I'm here to just plant a seed in front of you, and it's a journey that we're all embarking in together. Uh, and. And there's going to be more questions asked, but I just want to let you know that, hey, uh, there's this shift that has to happen first, because I, for one, I understand that my community's home, yes, they're in front of the mines, yes, they're in front of these situations, but we're not un always underserved, underprivileged, we're not always lack of resources, we're actually rich in wisdom, we're actually rich in knowledge, and I think that's a place that we need to pivot our mindset. So I just want to bring that up. Yeah. Okay, I'm just glad you brought that up because I think that's been a key learning um, just me personally in starting this work is that it's bringing different worlds together, different stakeholders together. The foundation of our program is a collaboration with external environmental justice partners that have been doing this work for decades. We started by saying, hey, we don't know how to do this. Well, I know that there's a Venn diagram out there that has corporate sustainability on one side and environmental justice on the other side. What is that overlap? When I started, I didn't, even, I didn't know what that looked like. I said, let's start with renewable energy because that's our biggest lever in procurement for sustainability. And also, we're one of many corporates who have really aggressive renewable energy goals. So you know, if we can pursue those goals, we also need to be pursuing a just transition. But in, in doing this work, I didn't know what I signed up for because I realized I'm entering into a whole new world, different language, different pace, um, and I see myself kind of as a translator 
to say, okay, here are the environmental justice issues, here's how corporates currently do things, where are the places in the system where we can insert um, you know, changes to start to create those co-benefits, and um, thank you all for mentioning that. I think the answer to your question is a yes. <laughs> yes. Um, a, a yes without an option of no. Because in business, everybody is there to, I'm going to assume, make money. Your, your companies and businesses are established to have some type of profit, some type of benefit for whatever the audience or the target market is. So that's not an option. In the same way, doing things in an equitable and just fashion is not an option if you want to continue to be relevant. And so what you were saying around language, I think, is so important because, yes, what is the language of business? It's accounting, it's dollars, it's money. What is the language of equity and justice? You don't know that language if you never experience the inequities. And, and, and that has to be a key point. There have to be people within the organization that can help to translate, that can help to teach you that language, because if I'm in a foreign country and I don't speak the language, uh, I'm one of those odd, crazy people that will actually put myself around people who also don't speak the language and we'll all be there together, not know what we're saying, <laughs> but having the best time of our lives. We have to figure out a way to communicate. You have to figure out a way to communicate. And I think the last very important part of that, at least to me, is to do so fearlessly. How many of you all have watched Bill I'm, I'm finishing it up now. Some of you have. All right. The idea of getting into something and doing it all out and completely and totally fearlessly when it comes to making money, to doing great things in business, we applaud that. But when it comes to equity and justice, we get scared. You cannot be scared doing this work. And so you have to learn. You have to enter some places that may be uncomfortable. But that is part of establishing the resiliency of climate and justice work. I love this conversation <laughs> about language and translating. And if you ask my wife, she says I'm really bad with languages. We live in many countries around the world. And uh, I mean, I, my Japanese is passable, but she picks up language right away. And she's bilingual, right? Me, I struggle with it. But I think, as you say this about translating, I've been spending my whole career translating the idea that we're talking about, about justice into business. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll give you a Starbucks example, right? <laughs> so 20 years ago, the people at the company said, oh, these small, poor, smaller coffee farmers around the world, we have to support them, right? And so they, they did it out of the justice, right, and that passion for supporting smaller farmers. And they created sustainable coffee standards, transparency with pricing and payments, and even top-up farmers when the price goes too low and things like that. And you know, support for environmental programs and precision agriculture and things like that, support for the communities, child care, and so forth. They did all these things 20 years ago in the company. But now, today, when we realize the business impact of the climate crisis. I'm sure you've all read this, right? By 2050, the amount of acreage where we can grow coffee will be cut in half due to climate change. So now, it's not just, yes, it's absolutely a question of justice, but it's also a question of corporate business survival. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So absolutely, the answer is yes, mm -hmm. from a justice standpoint, but also from a business survival standpoint. 
I so totally, oh, go ahead. I totally agree with that. And just in renewable energy procurement. Okay, so it was it said this morning in the Just Transition panel something like uh, to meet all these corporate sustainability goals, you need a land mass five times the size of India or something. Can anyone corroborate that? Or is my memory faulty? It just was staggering. Um, and with renewables, you know, even in the U.S., where a lot of power purchase agreements are signed to meet these commitments, I mean, supply is at is very lean. It's really hard um, to get the supply you need. And there are many documented examples of community members rising up and saying, no, no, not in my neighborhood, because they're not engaged. You know, communities are engaged at the very last minute. They're engaged only to mitigate risk and keep them at arm's length. Elected officials are the only folks that are contacted. Um, in, I know a case in Florida with a solar farm. I know a wind farm in Oaxaca, just to name a couple things. So, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> South Louisiana, yeah. Texas. Yeah. Yeah. You, can, you can keep naming them. Yeah. That is such a good point because the demographics have changed, and, and we tend to not take note of the demographics that we know are changing. Right now, in the United States of America, the top ten largest cities, seven of the top ten have mayors that are mayors of color. Three of the top five have black mayors. Those are totally shifting demographics. Houston, Chicago, and New York. Ports, the port of Houston, the port around New York. If we add in LA, that's four of the top five. The port in, in Los Angeles. Think about not only the economics of just those five entities, but think about also the social issues that are involved. And the intersections of climate, of economy, of sustainability, of resiliency. And who is making the decisions? So when we thought, think through the solutions and through the sustainable and resilient solutions that need to be presented and engaging the, the, the communities, if the communities look different than the people who are sitting in the corporations to make the decisions, there's going to be a problem. Yeah. Oh, I wasn't going to go here with this too, but what the hell? <laughs> yeah, so I've been coming to this for a long time, and I'm, I'm happy to see um, some increase in diversity. But let's face it, the corporate sustainability world is still predominantly white. And, and so are many of the NGOs that companies are working with in the climate space. How does being a person of color working in these predominantly white spaces add to the challenge of what's already challenging work? Oh, you're I am a black woman from Mississippi who currently lives in Mississippi in a red area. And I work for a majority, big green group that is historically majority white. And I have a lot of friends that ask me, how in the world did you get here working and coming from a space of both environmental and climate justice? My father was a retired civil rights attorney. I was a former mayor. I was an Obama appointee. So I, I think my track record for being engaged in the community is, 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 is good. But an environmental justice Dr. Bob Willard, Robert Willard, let me correct that, from Texas Southern University, told me you have to be in these places. It is so important that we have people everywhere who understand and have lived the experience and can be part of the conversation to create these solutions. This is a part of the progress. Is it easy? No. But one of the reasons that I chose the organization that I'm a part of, and I'm very proud to be in this organization at this point in what we're doing, is because there was a commitment to listening. There was a commitment to changing. There was a commitment to being authentic and honest to say, we don't know everything. And that's very difficult for large organizations to do, because you make money based upon your knowledge and your expertise. Mm -hmm. So to, to reckon with the fact that you might not know every single thing is hard. But EDF was willing to do that, and, and I, uh, it's my opinion, they've done a really good job. I see some 
things internally that maybe everybody else doesn't want to see. But I wouldn't be here if it didn't. Right? Well, I think some of the things that you know happen at Starbucks. There's a lot that happens externally, but I was very greatly appreciative for internally the conversations that have taken place. And I'll just add, as a woman of color who's in a majority organization, that we need to have more of that. There needs to be more people of color, people from different backgrounds, different age groups, young people who are engaged, who are part of the lived experience because they bring their whole selves to the work. And if their whole self is not accepted, you're not going to get the full benefit of that solution. I am black 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I don't get to take this off when I go home. So when I leave the office, yes, I'm concerned about police brutality because I have two black sons and a black husband. So it bothers me. I am worried at night about them getting stopped while I'm out of town. I don't get to leave that. But the fact that my, the, the place that I work understands that and listens to that and allows me to incorporate it into our solutions makes a world of difference. You know, um, you may feel like we're straying about climate change, but I have to tell you, I saw an email today, this morning. Um, it, it was probably not intended to come across this way, but the second paragraph started with, from climate change to racial justice, we have so many issues. Like, wow, I don't think they're at opposite ends of the spectrum. You know, <laughs> I thought it was really interesting that whoever wrote that email thought that that was the, the far end. But they're so deeply intertwined. Um, and you talked about bringing the voices, and I think this is a good place for Alfreda to tell us how do you connect the young people with lived experience to these opportunities to have an impact in the environment on climate in particular? Um, relationships, right? <laughs> yeah, I think relationships are is what is missing in everything, whether that's inside the organization or just networking with someone and then all of a sudden, you know, when the job opens up, it's like, that's the person that's going to get it before the job is even posted. So for us, you know, this is the story I like to tell. When I, when I go salsa dancing, usually I will be wearing something else and something fancy that's going to be And I'm excited. I can go with my mobile ice cream shirt on, and I don't feel like I'm sponsoring anyone. I can go to everyone in, in, in the dance room and be like, hey, yeah, I do this. Because I'm happy and I love it. And that's because I love getting youth of color into these positions because I know that they are so committed, they're so hungry to solve the battery issue, to solve the mining issue, to solve this other issue. So in order to do that though, it goes back to what I was saying before, it's, it's, it's language and the culture, thing, right? Like, hey, what's up, Jordan, you know, I'm she has it going, man? Yeah, you know, carbon emissions, we're stuck with carbon emissions, and you know, ah, the CFCs, PCPs, you know. But you know, you should come work for us. Yo, Jordan, what's up, man? You know, we're dancing salsa out there, and we're uh, rapping about climate justice and, and, and climate from life. We're doing some marketing material. We're working on some procurement policies, by the way. Which one sounds more exciting? Jordan's gonna go to the latter, right? And so I think a, a big part of this is just, yes, the language, but also the culture. How we're engaging with these youth, what topics are we talking about with them? The just transition seems to be a, a language that they're using, and so using the same language as them, right? Uh, so I think that's part of the puzzle, and, and I'm really excited about this. <laughs> Mike, yeah, Michael, please. And we're going to wrap this up shortly and move into some sort of concrete what's and how's and, and bring you folks in for questions. But first, I would like to hear your voice and then have a question for you. Yeah, I mean, back to your question about how is it to be a person of color doing this work. So, uh, y'all know what a banana is, <laughs> right? Y'all only outside, one on the inside. I guess we're not supposed to say that anymore. Um, so probably for the first 20 years of my career, I was a banana, you know, like I just got to fit in, right? That's the Asian-American kind of way, and the way you fit in, you don't want to stand out. 
And so I just, you know, kept pushing, plod along, going, going, me, you know, doing, making my bones, right, shut up, keep doing the work. And it was probably, probably about, well, I should say, I had, I had mentors along the way yeah. who helped me a lot. And they were not people of color, they were white people, right, who helped me get into those rooms, the boardrooms and the other rooms where decisions were made. So I got more comfortable and I got more confidence. I think probably about 15 years ago, I started finding my own voice and having the courage to speak up a little bit. Um, now maybe I speak up too much, but you know, I started finding my voice and and now I feel like I'm in those positions where I can be more of an advocate and a supporter and a mentor to the next generation. But I will tell all of you who are already in the next generation, something that one of my mentors told me a long time ago. In this field, he said the key things are passion, which has some all of us have, patience, which is important to learn, because it's not always happening as fast as we want, and perseverance. An important thing. Keep pushing ahead no matter what happens. And the other thing I found out, the other thing is important, is charm. You gotta make it so you gotta charm. You gotta, you know, like you gotta get them to be your friends. And that will help you go along the way. And you young people have a lot more opportunities than I did coming up. Because now, the organizations and the boards want you. My daughter's told me she's on the board of Environmental NGO now in the area. She does the same kind of work. So they're looking for you, so be ready. Thank you. And that really connects to the relationships point. Now, Fred was thinking, Danielle, they're not looking for us as much. Um, I think there are a lot of white people in this audience who are thinking, do I have a right to be the one who's taking the lead in this equity work in my company? Um, but you're doing it. Can you tell us a little about the challenges and, and how you tackle it? That's such an easy question. <laughs> <laughs> it happens. <laughs> Truly. <laughs> I, I'm going to be totally vulnerable here. Uh, the work for me started here, it has to start here. You know, if you're a white, first of all, just because I'm a white woman doesn't mean that I am not, cannot be part of the solution, okay? There's a role for allies, accomplices, co-conspirators, um, and sometimes, and it's always about not centering yourself. I'm talking to myself, by the way, I'm saying you, but I'm talking to myself. It's not about centering yourself, it's about uplifting others, amplifying others, what, what can I bring to the conversation, but also it's a journey of understanding how I have benefited from a system of white supremacy, and how, and really sitting with that, and, and dealing with that, um, and not becoming paralyzed, you know, using it as fuel to say, no, this is wrong, I need to be part of the solution, and then also, collaborating with folks that do have that lived experience and hiring folks that do have that lived experience and stepping aside. Thank you for sharing that. That really is brave. <laughs> um, well, so let's get down to some like, really brass tacks here. So you have done, like, you want to share with us one of the projects and that's a, a great example of what you're achieving in your climate strategy to address environmental justice. Still me. Still you. Okay. okay. Yeah. Because, <laughs> because yeah, uh, you pivot to the point is you are accomplishing things with a lot of partnerships and, and maybe talk about how you're making that happen. Yeah. So as I mentioned, starting with a foundation of partnerships with folks that have been doing this work for decades. Um, and so we started with listening and learning. We started with a workshop. You know, brought folks together. We did one day on renewable energy procurement, how that works in the corporate space. We did another day on really diving into the environmental and climate justice issues. And then we started to say, what are the tools and mechanisms we can use? Um, and that workshop blossomed into a two-year-long relationship 
uh, with a coalition of environmental justice organizations. And together we built a measurement and evaluation framework to help guide our environmental justice investments. And so that is on the verge of being finished and the coalition of EJ advisors are about to announce themselves and publish the framework and it's just gonna be a wonderful, wonderful day. Um, the use cases for the, that framework are, um, there are a couple use cases. One, is we can shape new projects. Um, so we have a project around circularity that's bubbling up. I can't really say too much about it yet, um, but it's very exciting. It includes um, feeding people, reducing food waste, um, and incorporating eventually into corporate procurement and having community and corporates be part of the same loop system. Hopefully we'll be able to talk more about that at Circularity 22. Small plug. Um, but with renewable energy procurement, because we started there, um, we have signed two power purchase agreements, one with Soul Systems for 500 megawatts and another um, with Bolt Energy, an African American owned developer for 250 megawatts. And the design of that, of those agreements, is that it requires the prior diversity in the supply chain and habitat restoration on site and then also a portion of the project revenues go toward a community fund. And that community fund goes toward uh, shovel-ready, um, community-led environmental justice projects, uh, resilience projects, um, and then also into workforce development so that we can actually start to address some of the root causes of not having supplier diversity. Um, so that's just a couple of the examples. That's pretty exciting. Michael, can you share some examples of uh, work you're doing at Starbucks? Sure, so a little, a little different than I mean, we did. We invited Heather and a number of other environmental justice leaders, including Dr. Robert Bullard, to speak with us and really help us understand and educate us about the issues. But I said patience is important, but I'm actually getting impatient now as I get older. <laughs> and I want things to happen faster. So I so we have, you know, we have 100% renewable energy for all of our stores because we're, you know, we're buying the rights and all of that. But the reason we've been investing in renewable energy projects, okay? So when I started, I asked that team, I said, so how do we decide where we're going to site the projects or where we're going to locate the projects? And he said, you know, well, it's tax and financial and where we have a lot of stores. And I said, well, do we ever ask the question? Uh, where are the communities that actually need this that are low and middle income frontline communities? And they said, no, we don't use that as criteria. And I said, well, could we? <laughs> and they said, yeah, sure. The data's there. We can do that. I said, well, let's start doing that. <laughs> and uh, we have a great partner who's leading that program. And so she did that. And the next investment we made was a $97 million project for community solar in the state of New York that is bringing renewable energy to 24,000 households and small businesses and including our stores in frontline communities in the state of New York. And going forward now, all of our renewable energy investments are using that, the environmental justice piece, as a criteria. So anything we do, we'll make sure it's located in one of those frontline communities, and we're giving renewable energy to folks who didn't have access before. And so it's just, I mean, for me, like you asked us before, about should we include justice? We have to. Right? If we're not asking that question of every sustainability project that we embark on, whether it's around waste or climate or water, we don't ask that question. What are we doing? We are supporting the existing racist system. If we don't include justice in our programs as a criteria, we are supporting the inherently racist system. So we have to, I mean, I don't know how we're going to do it and everything, you know, we're still figuring that out, but we have to. I'm glad you said you're still figuring it out. I know there's a lot of work to be done. And we just touched on 
renewable energy, we haven't talked about transportation, we haven't talked about supply chain, we haven't talked about offsets, agriculture. <laughs> Heather, uh, can you, are there other examples of projects that, uh, with companies you're working with that are great to highlight here? So that's why I love working with mayors, because they don't have a choice that to intercept with all of this. Uh, one of my favorite projects right now is work that we're doing in the petrochemical corridor, uh, which is South Louisiana, South Texas, uh, a part of the country that has not only um, been fraught with environmental injustices, but also is on the front lines of climate change. Hurricane season starts June 1. And so from that point on, and even now a little further, they're on high alert. So let me step back just real fast though, to say, EDF is doing two things. Up. The internal is we have not only the Office of Community Engagement, which I run, but we also have a Office of Environmental Justice and Equity, which is run by Margot Brown. Uh, she is the vice president of, of that part of EDF, and together we are continuing to look and challenge ourselves and ask the questions as we are able to better advise our partners in business and health and climate and energy on how to make these decisions. So that's a really, really strong step for our organization. Externally, my fun that I, I like right now is yes, definitely in the petrochemical border because we get to intersect all of those things. We get to help and look at how to drive community-led solutions from the perspective of the community. So often communities are seen as being the victim of environmental justice. And I think this is one of the things that you said before, you don't always see me as a victim. Because the community, while they have suffered environmental injustices, they have survived. And are some of, and they are the best. And thriving. And thriving, absolutely. And the best to tell you how to do it moving forward and solve more than one problem at a time. And so working in that corridor, I get to work with phenomenal people like Sharon Levine, Bryce St. James, who had me walk through the streets in St. James Parish to tell people that in case of a hurricane, we were going to meet at Rose's Catering instead of the Sites. I'm thinking we're still going to meet in a hurricane. That hadn't even crossed her mind. <laughs> She's just like, look, the water and rain comes, tell folks to go to this place versus this other place. That to me just exudes resilience. And <clears throat> that is the type of solution that will last. Because we need solutions for the climate crisis we're facing that can be adapted and empower communities to push it forward, that are things that are scalable. And that is one project that intersects agriculture, policy, economic development, education, public health, reducing violence, because I don't know if you know, but if it gets hot, people get crazy. <laughs> and they tend to have more violent activity. So reducing that, all of those things mix in one place. And it's hard. It's hard. But guess what? We get paid to do hard things. Yeah. The best of us, at least that's my, my thinking of it, the experts in this space, we're experts because we can figure out hard problems. In the petrochemical area, that's a hard one, but it's one that is really exciting because we can untangle this knot. I have about three hours more questions, <laughs> <laughs> but I want to open it to you folks if you have any questions. Okay. I, as I was asking, can I just say well, something I thought of when you were just saying that, Heather, is that, that kind of we can do hard things. Uh, I think sustainability professionals are uniquely equipped to tackle social justice. Well, there's an imperative. We've already talked about the imperative. But also, we're used to doing hard things because we have to break systems all the time. So why don't we, we're already breaking systems, like let's bring all the tools and create co-benefits, you know, for, for everyone. Be inclusive. Um, so we're already breaking things. Just go on and break some more. Break the right things. Uh, my, my profile says I like doing hard things. I like folding fitted sheets. Oh, <laughs> oh, 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 oh my god. Yeah. 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 Michael, you look like you want to 
questions. Um, so, all right, Paul. There you go. So, what I've heard a lot is like focusing on the community, the community has the solutions, and what happens when the solutions of the community members have um, contradict with what makes business sense or yeah, what your entities want to move forward? I, I first make us ask the question and try to get us to ask the question. What's the difference? What's the difference between a business decision and entity? Who has made that choice that's different from the community? And begin to merge those two and find places where we agree and where we disagree. Um, often, there's a lot of alignment that we just don't hear because we're not, we're talking past each other. So there's, for example, science and technology out now that says we should use certain systems to help us reduce global emissions, and there are environmental justice groups that say, no, that's not going to work. It's not because there is a disagreement around the technology or the science or some little bitty point. It, it has to do with how. Who is having the conversation? Mm -hmm. What are the, 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 the tactics being deployed? And is there really an understanding of the history, history of that community? And I think this is something you said a little earlier about like, bringing the community in the last minute. Mm -hmm. yep. and, but the truth is, I mean, let's be real. Some of these things cost money. And money that maybe is great return in the long run. But meanwhile, as someone said to me when we were chatting earlier, Jay, well, our stock's down a little. It's not a good time. So, you know, if I would like to ask, you know, <laughs> just going back to things like um, stocks, stock market. If I'm going into a community, I'm talking to a group about markets, that's something that's like markets. You're talking about grocery stores, you're talking about Kroger, Walmart. Um, what are you talking about? Markets. Not that they're unfamiliar with the concept. It's just a concept that is not something you can touch, taste, feel, or smell here. And so it has to be connected maybe in a different way to those communities, which again talks about why it's so important for companies to have this as a regular part of the conversation. So can you express that to your CFO, Michael? Look, uh, to respond to your question and picking up on, on what Heather said, right? I've been doing this work for 30 years. I've been talking to NGOs, very activist groups, Greenpeace, local NGOs, labor groups, right, and trying to figure this out. The lesson I've learned is that the closer you get to the actual community or factory, the more people agree on what needs to be done. Mm -hmm. Because they see the actual situation of this. Mm -hmm. You're talking to corporate level, you're always going to be talking back and forth. The closer you get to the ground, you'll get to a solution, and it will be a solution. Mm -hmm. Okay, can I have a moment? Uh, it also begs the question that I think we need to address, which is, is your role and title at your existing company ground level, or are you up at senior level? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I've seen a lot of times I'm talking to people who are working in environment, climate, sustainability, social, and they are the young people at the company. They're the entry level folks. That's the job line that is not the SVP. So how do we now create these issues that they are valued at the same way as the person who is the, the economic lead for the company? Because it has to be valued the same way. I promise you, when you go to a community group or a larger organization, they're looking to see what that title is, and they know if you're being sent as a manager versus the VP of the organization, because that speaks to value and the value that the organization places on equity, climate, social issues. And so we have to change that dynamic as well. I shouldn't be, don't, don't get me wrong, I still think I'm a young person. 
So, but, me too. <laughs> We're young. <laughs> but we shouldn't always say that when we have a conversation around climate justice, equity, that we're all talking to people who just came in and are out of graduate school or are just getting into this program. And y'all look really young. You look fabulous. <laughs> so no offense to anybody in here who might be my age. But it just says, where are we, where are we placing the value on this part? And how do we get our own companies to see it as being so valuable that they're equating it at the same level as some of the other roles? Beautifully phrased. Danielle, you put in self some projects. Um, I think, you know, this is also critical, but also that you need some, you know, toolbox. You know, can, you, can you speak to this a little bit? Yeah, well, I love what Heather said about meeting, and Michael said about meeting people on the ground, sometimes it's about just getting the, the leader on a plane. You know, get them there. Get them, you know, they're going to go probably anyway to meet with, you know, a major supplier or whatever, but increase the number of stakeholders that they touch, right? So identify the community leaders. Um, because once they have that face-to-face -face conversation, it's, it's a different set of decision factors. Also, you know, license to operate. If you're gonna expand your business, we've talked about this before, um, you know, you're gonna need to get permits, right? If there's community opposition, you're not gonna get permits. And every day you delay on a permit is thousands, sometimes millions of dollars. So, you know, any way you can quantify, you know, delay in, in operations is, is also really helpful. And sometimes it's also like marginal cost, you know? It's like, I mean, if this is a $100 million project, you know, putting a 1% premium on that to put money back into the community or create some sort of project that also benefits, aspect of the project that benefits the community, you know, it just seems like, oh, that's not a lot of money and I get to do something good? I mean, people want to do good things, you know? Uh, sometimes the difference between whether something's done, I, was, I have this theory about like ideal self versus real self, I have no degree or empirical data to back this up, but it's like your ideal self wants to do the right thing, right? It's your real self that sometimes gets in the way. I remember that date, no, I'm really going off a tangent, about that data about how people won't pay for green products, you know, if there's more than a 20% premium or something like that. So you just need to make it a little bit easier for the ideal self to kind of shine through. I, amazingly, now we have three minutes. Um, oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah, so, so, no, no, no. no. Um, but, you know, one of the things I learned early on, people talk about you need to have a business case. The business case doesn't sell it. People need to want to do it. The business case gives them cover to do it. Yeah, totally, totally. So, maybe we'll start with that. We have to, what? What's next? What should these people leave with? What should they do next? Yeah, the, the small bit, right? And, um, I sense that the conversation turned quickly into business language, and I can speak to business language too. Let's talk about marketing and how the product development can be different with the diversity. Let's talk about procurement, how that could be diversity youth too. Let's talk about uh, recruitment, retention. Those are all costs that are going to exponentially increase if you hire right for the right time for the right job. So I'm talking, I'm, I'm talking a different language too, and I can do that and. What I want to let you know is that in this just transition, you and I were talking about it, we need a small win, right? A small win to get us to the next one, to the next one. And I think the small win is putting some of these youth into opportunities where they can be the translators. Because they have the relationships with the communities. The communities are more likely to accept the youth that is there to learn and ask some questions. And I'm here to just say that here is an opportunity for a small win because with Mobilize Green, we are the best organization, not only are recruiting diverse youth who are environmentally justice focused, but we're the best at making sure that they start their careers in permanent jobs. And we're successful in the federal government, and we got a couple whispers from the corporate sector saying that they need us here. So, hello, my name is Alberto Gonzalez. <laughs> and uh, I'm happy to uh, chat with you. I'm happy to find out about your favorite food, and I'm happy to, to talk to you about your project needs so we can change someone's lives. Can I ask this out there? Yeah. What? Oh, I'm afraid I'm not going to do this. 